Okay, turn with me, if you would, to Romans chapter 14. Romans chapter 14, and we're going to be looking uh, a lot at all of chapter 14. Well, we're going to read all of chapter 14 and into chapter 15, but we're going to spend most of our time in the beginning of chapter 14 and the beginning of chapter 15 today. Let me pray, and then I will read that to you. Father, we ask again for your blessing on this time in clarity, in unity, in charity towards one another, in kindness, that it would be for your glory and our good. Father, uh, show us uh, the sinful way of our own hearts and our propensity towards uh, such things as judging uh, when we know that you alone are the righteous judge. Father, I believe there is great confusion in our world on what this means, and so I ask that you would bring great clarity to us, that we might display your goodness and your glory and your grace and your might to the world around us. And I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Follow along with me as I read to you Romans chapter 14 and then a bit into chapter 15. As for the one who is weak in faith, welcome him, but not to quarrel over opinions. One person believes he may eat anything, while the weak person eats only vegetables. Let not the one who eats despise the one who abstains, and let not the one who abstains pass judgment on the one who eats, for God has welcomed him. Who are you to pass judgment on the servant of another? It is before his own master that he stands or falls, and he will be upheld, for the Lord is able to make him stand. One person esteems one day as better than another, while another esteems all days alike. Each one should be fully convinced in his own mind. The one who observes the day observes it in honor of the Lord. The one who eats, eats in honor of the Lord, since he gives thanks to God, while the one who abstains, abstains in honor of the Lord and gives thanks to God. For none of us lives to himself, and none of us dies to himself. For if we live, we live to the Lord, and if we die, we die to the Lord. So then, whether we live or whether we die, we are the Lord's. For to this end Christ died and lived again, that he might be both Lord both of the live dead and of the living. Wow, I'm going to read that verse again. For to this end Christ died and lived again, that he might be Lord both of the dead and of the living. Why do you pass judgment on your brother? Or you, why do you despise your brother? For we will all stand before the judgment seat of God. For it is written, as I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me and every tongue shall confess to God. So then each of us will give an account of himself to God. Therefore, let us not pass judgment on one another any longer, but rather decide never to put a stumbling block or hindrance in the way of a brother. I know and am persuaded in the Lord Jesus that nothing is unclean in itself, but it is unclean for anyone who thinks it unclean. For if your brother is grieved by what you eat, you are no longer walking in love. By what you eat, do not destroy the one for whom Christ died. So do not let what you regard as good be spoken of as evil. For the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking, but of righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. Whoever thus serves Christ is acceptable to God and approved by men. So then let us pursue what makes for peace and mutual upbuilding. Do not, for the sake of food, destroy the work of God. Everything is indeed clean. But it is wrong for anyone to make another stumble by what he eats. It is good not to eat meat or drink wine or do anything that causes your brother to stumble. The faith that you have, keep between yourself and God. Blessed is the one who has no reason to pass judgment on himself for what he approves. But whoever has doubts is condemned if he eats, because the eating is not from faith. For whatever does not proceed from faith is sin." We who are strong have an obligation to bear with the failings of the weak and not to please ourselves. Let each of us please his neighbor for his good to build him up. For Christ did not please himself, but as it is written, the reproaches of those who reproached you fell on me. 
For whatever was written in former days was written for our instruction, that through endurance and through the encouragement of the scriptures, we might have hope. May the God of endurance encourage, uh, may, may the God of endurance and encouragement grant you to live in such harmony with one another, in accordance with, in accord with Christ Jesus, that together you may with one voice glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, welcome one another as Christ has welcomed you, for the glory of God. We come today to the final peril uh, of peacemaking, the final peril that's easy to get caught in when it comes to being a, a church that makes peace. Two weeks ago, that would be three Sundays ago, including today, we saw that the first peril of a peacemaking church is anger. That God sees anger as murder and that to be angry with one another is to commit murder against one another. Last week we saw that uh, litigating, whether in the actual courts of the world or even just in the court of our own mind, is harmful to a church's unity. And today we see that judging is a tremendous peril for the church. I think it is impossible to overstate the divisiveness and destructiveness of judging. It is destructive to a church's fellowship. It is destructive to a church's peace. It is destructive to a church's unity. And I think because of all of those things, it is destructive, maybe most importantly, to a church's witness of the gospel. Our society loves this word, and we have distorted what the, what, what the idea of judging actually is. The picture that movies and, and TV and maybe even everyday experience would teach us is that if somebody does something wrong, let's say they steal a large sum of money from their employer, and you go to that person and you say, that was wrong, you need to make that right. They might say something like, don't judge me. We, we've kind of equated the idea of judging with telling anybody that anything is wrong. And we've written out, as we looked at last week, Matthew 18. Jesus says, if your brother, if you have anything against your brother, go to him and tell him his sin. And if he confesses, you've won your brother. A, a modern dialogue would look like this. If your brother has something against you, don't say anything to him because telling him that what he is doing is wrong is judging. But that's not what judging is biblically. And I think, sadly, the church has bought into this idea. Not every church and not every believer, but many churches have. We, in the sake of love, will permit anything. It's kind of true of our society and becoming more and more true of churches, that as long as you fly the banner over your actions of love, anything is permissible. Matthew chapter 7, verses 1 and 2 says this, Judge not that you be not judged. For with the judgment you pronounce, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Uh, I think what, God, what, what Jesus is calling for here in the Sermon on the Mount is not for believers never to say that somebody has done something wrong. And that is not the biblical idea of judging. It, it is not judging to call wrong what God has already judged to be wrong. L let me restate that. It is never wrong to call wrong what God has already judged to be wrong. The reason for that is because while nowhere in Scripture are you or I told that we are to judge according to our standards, God is repeatedly and decisively presented as the judge of all mankind. That he will judge the living and the dead. He will judge believers and non-believers. But the truth of the matter is, 
When we buy into this, and we all buy into this, by the way, it's not a new problem. Paul just spent a lengthy amount of time addressing it to a church almost 2,000 years ago. The problem is not so much our society. The problem is our hearts, right? But we're hypocrites. We're hypocrites as we do this. We, we have people who come to us and tell us that we're doing something wrong, maybe even something that God has already judged wrong, and our response is, don't judge me. All the meanwhile, we pass judgment along on other people. Well, that was wrong of them. Really? You know how often I hear people say that somebody did something wrong and there is nothing in Scripture that speaks to that matter? We'll get to some specific examples, and I think, um, I think maybe that will help. But let me give you a definition of judging so that we can understand what we're talking about in this sermon today. Here is my definition of judging. Judging is making matters of preference or conscience into matters of right or wrong. Judging is making matters of preference or conscience into matters of right and wrong. And then, here's especially the difficult part, and then applying those to other people. Maybe there is something that you determine in your Christian walk is not something that you can do for the glory of God. And so you choose to abstain. Or on the flip side, maybe there's something in your Christian walk that you must do for the glory of God. To honor Him. And then... You make that uh, principle, that benefit, that matter of conscience or preference in your life into a rule. And then that rule becomes something that you begin to apply to others. Now we are judges with unrighteous standards. See, what happens when we do that, when we take our preferences and we elevate them to matters of right and wrong and then apply those to other people, here's essentially what we're saying. You should look like me rather than Christ. That's what judging does, is it tells people, you need to look like me. Now, let's look at this in terms of examples. I want to paint some real world examples. Here are some things that have already, in scripture, been judged as wrong. Murder, idolatry, fornication, adultery, homosexuality. We like lists like this because they seem far off. Well, I've never killed anybody. I'm not cheating on my wife. But God has also judged, to be wrong, pride, self-sufficiency, idle speech, anger, greed, worry, anxiety, gossip, drunkenness, division, disunity, foul language, taking the Lord's name in vain, laziness. All of these have also been judged wrong by God. Those ones we, we get a little more uncomfortable with because they hit home. We find ourselves guilty. These are all matters of right or wrong. When you hear somebody say, and we sadly hear it all too much, oh my God, it is not judging to say, why take the name of our Lord so flippantly? Or when we hear somebody else talking about somebody else, or when somebody gets prideful and puffed up, it's never wrong to say, hey, that's wrong. You shouldn't do that. That's not judging. God has already judged those things wrong. What kinds of things has God not judged as wrong, though? I sat down and I thought to myself, what are some things that are issues that Christians turn into matters of wrong and right? Matters of preference, maybe matters of conscience. And here's, here's a few. Uh, worship music style. Pews versus chairs. 
how to educate our kids. You must homeschool. You must Christian school. You must public school. Uh, working versus stay-at-home moms. Sermon length. Service length. Moving decorations in the church. Paint colors. Drums in church. Cards. Alcohol. And then, of course, TV and movies. How dare, how dare that believing brother or sister have a TV or go to the movies? That's wrong. Is it? Is it inherently wrong? Now, while a TV and a movie theater are inherently non-moral, what goes on the TV is never non-moral. <laughs> okay, so I'm not saying that we have freedom to watch anything. But hopefully as we hear these examples, we see that the difference between sin, what God has already judged to be wrong, and opinion is obvious. Making preferences, making my preferences or my matters of conscience, right or wrong, ruins unity. And it's how the church ends up with sayings like this. Maybe you've heard it before. To live above with saints we love, oh, how that will be glory. To live with, below with saints we know, now that's a different story. What causes that kind of division in the church? Well, we've seen that anger does. We've seen that litigating does. But we also see that judging does. So what are we to do? What are we to do in terms of judging? If we are not given permission by God to make preferences in matters of conscience right or wrong, what do we do with somebody who disagrees with us? If you are convinced in your mind that alcohol, the use of alcohol, is always wrong, what do you do with your drinking believers? Drinking believing friends? How do you relate to them? How do you interact with them? Well, Paul tells us, look with me at Romans chapter 15, verse 7. Therefore, welcome one another. There's what we do. When we disagree with somebody on matters of preference or matters of conscience that are not clear matters that God has already judged wrong, we welcome those with whom we disagree with. Now, chapter 15, verse 7 is the end of a long argument that starts all the way back in chapter 14, verse 1. And so let's go back there, and we're going to kind of unpack some of this. In verse 1, Paul gives us an imperative. As for the one who is weak in faith, welcome him. There's the command. Somebody is weak in the faith as compared to you. They are forbidding something that you permit. What, what is our responsibility as Christians? The command comes here. Welcome Welcome them. Welcome the weak. Take them in. Verse 3 gives us the indicative, the reason why, and it's a big one. Because God, end of verse 3, has welcomed him. Why must we welcome the brother or sister with whom we disagree? Because God has. The context of this whole letter, let's zoom out for a second and get that. The context for the whole letter is that Paul is writing the church in Rome to prepare them for his upcoming visit. And he gives his by far most thorough treatment of the gospel, of the sinfulness of man, of the plan of God to redeem, of the sufficiency of Christ, of the unseparable nature of God's love for us. And he does it over 11 chapters, longer than most books that he's written uh, that we read in the New Testament. And he gets to chapter 12, and he begins to tell the church how they are to live in light of the gospel. But his largest address to the Romans, uh, as far as response to the gospel, is this right here. This matter of judging other believers. 
And so here's Paul's main point. Catch this. Listen carefully. I'm going to read it exactly as I wrote it because it's worth getting right, and I'll read it twice. The gospel shapes community by constraining us to manifest the grace of welcoming one another. The gospel shapes community by constraining us to manifest the grace of welcoming one another. And so we're going to look today at three things about the grace of welcoming that we need to understand. The gist of welcoming, the ground of welcoming, and the goal of welcoming. What is the gist of welcoming? What does it mean to welcome somebody? Well, you can come to church with me. I'll sit in the same pew as you. You're welcome to that. Is that what it means to be welcoming? That we will accept them into the same body but largely ignore them? I don't think so. The idea of welcoming here is, is embracing. It is to bring to one's self. It is a determination to embrace relationally those who disagree with us on non-essential matters. I think the vast majority of churches myself included, tend to pool around us the people with whom we agree. And what Paul is saying here is, go find the ones who disagree with you and draw them in. Enter into community with them. Show them grace on non-essential matters, matters of conscience or matters of, of preference. Paul here in Romans 14 and 15 and also in 1 Corinthians 8 where he gives us a similar argument uh, identifies um, two categories of believers. Strong believers and weak believers. If you'll notice, he includes himself in this category of strong believers because if you look at 15 verse 1, he says, we. He uses the first person plural, we who are strong. In verse 14, or cha verse 1 of chapter 14, he says, as for the one who is weak in faith, welcome him. Paul assumes two types of believers here, the strong believer and the weak believer. Well, what does he mean? In order for us to understand what he means, we have to understand the two examples he gives us. And, he, and these, these examples overlap, by the way, with 1 Corinthians 8. The two examples he gives us here, and we're not going to spend a large amount of time looking at these, is meat sacrificed, meat eating, we'll just suffice it there, or day keeping. So one person says, this day is uh, esteemed above all days. It is the prime day. It is the day we worship. This might be our seventh day Baptist brothers and sisters who say that, that the Sabbath is a command and we must keep it. Or if we consider 1 Corinthians 8, we might think of this meat eating as probably meat that, it had, been, that had been sacrificed before an idol and was now being sold in the marketplace. And Paul says, what does it matter if the cow was killed in front of an idol or not? What's an idol? It's nothing. And so if your conscience is clear, eat. And if your conscience is not clear, don't eat. And if your conscience is clear, don't dare offend the one who does not eat. Let me see if I can put this into a different category. It would be sinful of me to sneak pork into a meal if I knew my Seventh-day Adventist brother or sister were coming to my home. Now, I'm free to eat. Paul's free to eat. He says he doesn't care about who, uh, about who, you know, what, what this meat was sacrificed in front of. But there are some whose consciences were not clear. And so Paul says, look, there's, there's the weak brother whose mind and liberty is constrained by law. And then there is the strong brother whose mind and liberty is free. Now, we have to be very, very careful here. Because if we were to back up to chapter 6 of Romans, Paul has already made it clear that liberty in Christ is never license to sin. 
He's not saying that, um, uh, um, I, okay, I, I know I've used this example before, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give it to you for reals. I, I think the best way we could possibly describe Game of Thrones is pornography. I don't watch it. I have not seen it. I would not. Because it is full of sinful and lewd and wrong things. And yet, uh, somebody posted an article online about why Christians should never watch it. And one pastor gets on there and he comments, I don't, I tell my church they should not watch this because they do not have the spiritual maturity to watch it without sin. But I do, and therefore I watch. This is a man who has taken liberty and turned it into license. He is the immature one there, not his congregation. Paul says, should we continue in sin that grace may abound? May it never be. It is a very, very emphatic uh, construction in Greek. No way. Impossible. A believer using the gospel and grace and liberty as license to sin? No. But when we step out of that boundary of sin and we talk about areas of conscience and matters of preference, Paul's default assumption is that the one with greater liberty is the stronger believer. And then he makes sure that those stronger believers know that they are the mature ones. And that they don't use their preferences to offend somebody else. We hired a worship pastor at the church I worked at in Tucson. He was a younger guy. And the change in music style reflected that. And it bothered some of the older people. Well, one of them came up to complain to one of the elders one day, an elderly man himself, and said, you know, this, th this music just isn't as good. It's not my preference. I've been here a long time. You know, I've paid my dues, and, and, and this is not what I want. And he basically looked at him and said, yeah, you have been long here a while. Who is supposed to be the mature one here? See, the stronger believer has greater liberty, but the stronger believer also is the one who does not use his liberty to offend. So I might not take a Jewish person or a Seventh-day Adventist person out to breakfast, and while they ordered eggs, I ordered ham. Why? Maybe that would offend them. Maybe that would offend their conscience. And as the one with greater liberties, it is my responsibility not to use my liberty to offend. But Paul's, Paul's response here is, when you disagree with somebody on matters of conscience or preference, draw them in, welcome them. And, and, and here's the catch, though. Here's how we know that this cannot be sin. Look at the motive of each person in verse 6 of chapter 14. The one who observes the day, observes it in honor of the Lord. The one who eats, eats in honor of the Lord, since he gives thanks to God. There may be somebody out there whose conscience says, I cannot partake in alcohol because it affects my relationship with the Lord. I love booze more than I love Christ. And so I may not partake. And they, they create that rule for them. What is the, the, for themselves, what is their motive in that? To honor the Lord. What about the one who says Sunday is the, or Saturday is the day on which I must worship? Because that is God's command. Scripture would tell us that kind of, that kind of constraint is immature. Despite the fact that it's immature, it would be done for the honor and glory of God. What about Paul telling Timothy, I know you have frequent stomach aches. Your body, as I've previously written, is a temple of the Holy Spirit. God uses it 
earthen vessel as it is, as a minister, as a tool for ministry. Therefore, to settle your stomach so that you might feel better, so that you might minister better, don't drink only water anymore. Have some wine to settle your stomach. As Paul tells Timothy in Scripture, is Timothy, does Timothy have liberty to partake? Yes. You're not going to find Timothy at the bar saying, I'm hanging out for the glory of God because I might get to witness to somebody someday. His liberty can't become license, but on either side of the equation, the one who has more liberty or the one who has less, as long as they are using their liberty for the glory of God, they do it in honor of the Lord. In other words, let's add a category of person here. Paul sees three categories of people in, in Romans. Those who live in their sinfulness, who have no victory over sin, who are enslaved by besetting sins, they're unbelievers. Then there are those who live according to a set of rules designed to constrain themselves for the glory of God. That is an immature believer. We should not belittle that. If somebody comes to us tomorrow and says, I've been living with a, an addiction to stuff on the computer for the last 20 years, we would do well to put some laws and rules and accountability in place to keep them from that. Would we not? But hopefully in 20 years, they're not still struggling with that sin. And if they are, we might have to consider that they have not yet surrendered to Christ. Because there is not victory over that sin. And then the third category of believers is those who have liberty. Uh, um, Jim Boyce records uh, Charles Spurgeon as having understood this very well. He gave three examples. Uh, a lady came up to Spurgeon and said, Sir, it's quite disturbing to me how much humor you use in your sermons. And he said, Ma'am, if you want to be disturbed, you should see how much I leave out. <laughs> Or a young man came to him concerned about a, what, a, a box of cigars that somebody had given him. And he says, Mr. Spurgeon, what should I do with this box of cigars? Spurgeon's response was, give it to me. I will smoke them to the glory of God. <laughs> or he was traveling on a train one time. And a member of the congregation uh, saw him in the first class car and came up to him and said, Mr. Spurgeon, how can you be sitting up here? I'm back in coach taking care of the Lord's money. And Charles Spurgeon's response was, well, I'm in first class taking care of the Lord's servant. He had liberty. He had liberty. He actually had it in his calendar. He had a coach that took him to the church on Sunday mornings and it was in his calendar, smoke a cigar to the glory of God. I'm not advocating cigar smoking. The problem in Rome is that both sides were passing judgment on the other side. And look what Paul says in chapter 14, verse 3. Who are you to pass judgment on the servant of another? It is before his own master that he stands or falls, and he will be upheld, for the Lord is able to make him stand. In other words, stop. Stop judging. Stop being partial in matters of preference and in matters of opinion. Rather, welcome people. I want to give us a real example of what it looks like to welcome people. Don't turn there, but if you go just to the end of the book before, Acts 28, we have a great example of the use of this word. This is Luke writing. He's with Paul. They've been in a shipwreck. They land on the island of Malta. This is what we're told. After we were brought safely through... We then learned that the island was called Malta. The native people showed us unusual kindness, for they kindled a fire and welcomed us all, because it had begun to rain and we were cold. That's the picture of welcoming. 
Paul's in a shipwreck. It's raining. He's cold. He's got nothing to, to, uh, to keep warm with. And the people on the island said, come in, come into my home, come in where it's dry. Let me give you food. Let me give you dry clothes. Let me help you on your way. That is what it means to welcome. And that is why I think embrace is such a good word here. The word in Greek literally means to take to oneself, to accept, to receive. This is what we do with those whom we disagree with. We bring them in and we receive them. But Paul understands the nature of our hearts. And so look what he says in chapter 14, verse 1. As for the one in w- who, is, who is weak in faith, welcome him, but not to quarrel over opinions. In other words, when you disagree with them on matters of conscience, matters of preference, don't try and convince the other person. Don't try and convince them you're right. Maybe they refrain from alcohol. Maybe you consume. Neither side should be trying to convince the other side of their, of their position. Why? Because then we're putting uh, ungodly restraints on people's consciences. We're not to welcome people in to argue. Ours is not to change their mind. It is simply to welcome, to love, and to embrace. The gist of welcoming as a gospel-shaped community is an ongoing determination to embrace others in spite of our difference on morally neutral matters. The gist of welcoming is to embrace others, to embrace those who disagree with us, to draw them into fellowship and kindness and care, not to argue and in spite of differences on morally neutral matters. We're going to start moving fast now. What is the ground of welcoming? On what basis do we welcome? Paul gives two big, huge reasons to welcome people. Number one is the gospel. The gospel. Look with me at at chapter 14, verse 3, and then 15, verse 7. Let not the one who eats despise the one, uh, uh, let not the one who eats despise the one who abstains, and let not the one who abstains pass judgment on the one who eats, for God has welcomed him. And then he goes on to say in chapter 15, verse 7, Therefore, welcome one another as Christ has welcomed you. There's the gospel. You know what the big difference between our welcoming of believers with whom we disagree with and Christ's welcoming of us? This is a call to welcome those who we, we disagree with on non-moral matters. What Paul is saying here is that God has welcomed us as morally filthy sinners. Look at Romans chapter 5, verses 6 through 10. We are told here... Um, It would be good if I had the right chapter. For while we were still weak at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. For one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person one would dare even to die. But God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since therefore we have now been justified by his blood, much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. For while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son. Much more more now that we are reconciled shall we be saved by his life God welcomed me as a filthy wretched sinner that is his basis for calling me to accept to welcome and to draw in somebody whom I disagree with on non-moral matters the second reason Paul gives is the judgment of all believers Let that sink in for a minute. The judgment of all believers. Who are you to pass judgment on the servant of another? 14 verse 4. It is before his own master that he stands or falls, and he will be upheld, for the Lord is able to make him stand. 
Paul likens judging other believers on the basis of non-moral matters like meddling in people's household affairs. In this day, slaves lived with their masters, and they were accountable to their masters. And you did not go to somebody else's home and begin telling their slaves what to do. Paul says to apply your conscience to somebody else is meddling in the affairs of somebody else's home. And you don't meddle with God's slaves. In other words, someone else's conviction... Here it is. I'm going to slow down. Again, I'm going to read this just like I wrote it. (laughs) In other words, someone else's conviction on non-moral matters is none of your business. Nor is it mine. Because he has a master or she before whom she or he is accountable. Before whom they will fall. Look at chapter 14, verses 10 through 12. Why do you pass judgment on your brother? Or you, why do you despise your, your brother? For we will all stand before the judgment seat of God. For it is written, as I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall confess to God. So then each of us will give an account himself to God. Paul takes it a step further and says it's playing God. Verse 4 of chapter 14. Who are you to pass judgment on the servant of another? It is before his own master that he stands or falls. We don't get to make ourselves the masters of others. And check this out. He will be upheld for the Lord is able to make him stand. Consider this for a moment. When you make an unrighteous judgment on a non-moral matter, a matter of preference or conscience, and you begin applying to that to others and judge and, and begin judging them, God causes them to stand. It is to make ourselves the enemy of God. When we oppose others on matters of judgment, God guards them. God causes them to stand. God becomes their advocate and our enemy. Listen to this from John Piper, and we'll move on to the last point. When your life extends and channels the forgiving grace of God in Christ to others, it's plain that you are the recipient of the forgiving grace of Christ. The merciful will receive mercy in the judgment, not because mercy earns mercy, But because treating others with the mercy of Christ shows you have received and trusted the mercy of Christ. Your name is in the book. But if you judge and judge and judge with no brotherly affection, then you should tremble and seek to confirm by faith in Christ that your name is written in the book of life. Why do the merciful receive mercy? They're merciful because they've received mercy. They don't receive mercy because they're merciful. And those who can't show mercy, who just go around judging everybody else on non-moral matters, meddling in the household affairs of God, ought to consider whether or not they have received mercy. Thirdly, the goal of welcoming There is nothing less than the glory of God at stake here. Look with me at chapter 15, verse 7. Therefore, welcome one another as Christ has welcomed you for the glory of God. Uh, I think that the most striking word in this verse should be the word, therefore. Because when we see the word therefore, we should always ask, what is it there for? This verse 7 here is a response to Paul's prayer in verses 5 and 6. Look at his prayer there. May the God of endurance and encouragement grant you to live in such harmony with one another in accord with Christ Jesus that together you may with one voice glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. He says, live in unity. 
May, may God grant you to live in harmony, that together with all the believers there in Rome or in Athena, you might with one voice, with unity, glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, Paul, you want us to have harmony that God may have glory. How do we do that? That's verse 7. Therefore, welcome one another as Christ welcomed you. Warren Wearsby calls this kind of welcoming of those with whom we disagree on non-moral matters. Um, well, he said this. He said, the neighbors are watching. The neighbors are watching. Athena is watching. Athena is watching how we talk about each other. Athena is watching how we embrace one another. Athena is watching uh, about how we get along when we don't agree. And when we avoid, when we tiptoe, when we refuse to embrace, when we, when we talk about... All they see is that we're just like them, except we waste three hours of our Sunday mornings and however much of our money we decide to put in the plate that week. No, thank you. I'll keep my money and my time because we're already just alike. But when they see us embracing those with whom we disagree, let me put it this way. Athena is watching what type of political stuff you post on Facebook. Or how you talk about those who disagree with you at the sugar shack. Francis Schaeffer called this the final apologetic. It is the, it is the proof that Christ is real. When author said, a welcoming, receiving, embracing spirit towards those who differ with us on some of these thorny issues speaks volumes to the praise and glory of God before a watching world. Paul does not concern himself as much with who is right or who is wrong. That's not the point. It's how we treat one another. His preeminent concern is that we guard the peace, unity, and harmony of the community and thus safeguard the Lord's reputation before the eyes of an often skeptical and cynical world. Listen to that again. His preeminent concern is that we guard the peace, unity, and harmony of the community and thus safeguard the Lord's reputation before the eyes of an often skeptical and cynical world. There is nothing less at stake here than the glory of God. So four quick questions. Number one, how welcoming of a Christian are you? How welcoming of a Christian are you? Think of whatever preference it is you, you cling to most strongly. How welcoming are you to those people who disagree with you there on those matters? Whatever that preference is, give it up. Clinging to those preferences rather than clinging to one another hinders and ruins the unity and the testimony of Athena Baptist Church. Number two, what category best fits you? If there is a, a dominating sin in your life, maybe you should consider what name is written in the book. Can somebody genuinely come to Christ and be unchanged? I think the answer is a resounding no. The overwhelming testimony of Scripture is no. You cannot come to Christ genuinely and be unchanged. I'm studying for men's camp and one of the things I've been thinking about that scares the heck out of me is, is um, if you've had a vaccine recently, pick any vaccine, uh, measles, that's what's going around, right? 
Um, what do they do to give you or, or, or to build up your immunity to measles? They give you the measles in just the right dose so that your body builds up an immunity to it. If your life is entirely or even mostly unchanged by Christ, your great fear is that you should, is that, should be that you've received enough religion to be immune to the gospel. Oh, what a tragedy to live in the church to be dependent upon a time when I prayed a prayer or raised a hand or walked an aisle, but never surrendered myself to the Lordship of Christ. And to have him say on that day, depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. You had religion, but you did not have me. If there is a controlling, besetting sin that is unconquerable, you ought to take serious evaluation as to whether or not your name is written in the Lamb's book of life. If you have a free conscience, but you judge others, you apply your judgments to them, that's a weak believer. If you have a conscience that is bound by law, that's a weak believer. But if you have a conscience that is free, that understands, as Paul has already told us in these verses, that, that nothing in itself is unclean, but you're not using those liberties to harm other people. That's a mature, strong believer. Is there anything wrong with being a weak believer? No, but there is something wrong with staying there. It is within the context of this letter that we are told by Paul that it is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Therefore, do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. Maybe there's a, a rule I need to live by to protect myself and my relationship with God because of my own sinful tendencies. Just don't apply those to other people. What category of believer best fits you? Thirdly, what might help you appreciate the grace of the gospel and the weight of God's judgment more for the purpose of cultivating a more welcoming spirit? How can you understand the gospel of grace and the weight of God's judgment more so that you might be more welcoming to other people? I'll give you a quick suggestion. Read Romans or Galatians over and over and over again. Or do that with somebody. Invite them into that conversation. And number four, have you considered the connection between Athena Baptist Church's unity and the glory of God in the community? Have you considered the connection between Athena Baptist Church's unity and the glory of God in the community? We had better... We had better consider it. We need to consider our witness... As a congregation, we're not getting any younger. The number of those who are shut in and separated from us are growing. I want this church to be here until the Lord returns. But we may have to understand, as a church, it's time to consider what our witness in the world is, and maybe time to consider our efforts at evangelizing, because we might have to consider it's time to evangelize for our own survival. Francis Schaeffer called this kind of unity the final apologetic, the final proof of God's goodness. And then he said this, we cannot expect the world to believe that the Father sent the Son, that Jesus' claims are true, and that Christianity is true, unless the world sees some reality of the oneness of true Christians. Now that is frightening. He said that. <laughs> Now that is frightening. I'll read that again. We cannot expect the world to believe that the Father sent the Son, that Jesus' claims are true, and that Christianity is true unless the world sees some reality of the oneness of true Christians. Now that is frightening. Father, let the world see the oneness of true Christians in us. Unite us in the gospel. 
make it crystal clear to us that every believer stands and falls before you and before you alone, that you are an absolutely perfect, impartial judge who sees right to the heart of all people. And let us be content to leave things there. Lord, let us stand for matters of truth. Let us fight against our own sinfulness and our own flesh. But Father, let us lay aside those things with, with, with which we judge others impartially and unjustly and simply commit ourselves to loving, embracing fellowship of one another for your glory and for the good of your church. And I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.